Welcome to another message as we preach from God's Word, from the Gospel according to Mark, from the Greek language. I know some of you pastors out there, uh, I see people using almost exactly the same titles that I use on Sermon Audio, and that's fine. You know, uh, imitation is the greatest form of flattery. I'm very happy that people can get something out of the things that I preach from the original languages, from deep, deep study. I have done this most of my life, and it is a thrill every time I teach God's Word. These are the last few messages that I'm doing this year. 253 messages uh, that I preached this last year with this message. We're in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, 14 and verse 1. And we're talking, <coughs> we're, we are visiting some very wicked people. We are visiting some very wicked people that lived nearly 2,000 years ago. These people are extremely wicked. And we're going to see that what they are doing, and we're going to all I have to say is that everything that happened to them then, they deserved every bit of it. And we shall be introduced and visit to those people as we go. These are men whose hearts were full of murder. Men whose hearts were full of murder and sin. And yet they were religious. These are religious people that are horrible sinners, murderers, liars, cheats, thieves, plotters. Fourteen verse one. Ain de to pasca kai ta azuma meta dio hemeras kai zeton hoi akerias Kai hoi grometes pos auto indolo kratesantes apokatenaisen. And it kept on being the Passover. This is a very, very religious time of the year for the Jews. This is the time of the year that their sins were forgiven. They went down and they would confess. They would take a lamb per household. And they would keep that, house, that lamb in that house and make sure that the lamb was absolutely perfect in every way. It could not have a flaw in it. And they would keep it in there in the house for a week and look at it and watch it and make sure it had no defects because this lamb would be their sacrificial atonement for their sins. Now 1 John 2 and 2 1 John 2 and 2 is a very beautiful verse because it tells the fulfillment of that. 1 John 2 and 2 Let's See if I can find that quickly. I can quote it just about as well, but I'd like to read it. First John, the second chapter, and verse two, one of the greatest verses in the Bible. Let's go to verse number one, because this is beautiful. My little children. I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. Boy, these guys needed this. These guys needed this real powerfully. My little children, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he himself is a propitiation, the mercy seat, the offering, the atonement for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the 
those of the whole entire human race. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep and guard his commandments. Verse number 4 says, The one who says, I have come to know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now Jesus is surrounded by religious malefactors. He is surrounded by the, grammar, uh, by the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the priests, the high priests, the Levites, the Hellenistic Jews, and all of these people, the Herodians, the Sicarii. Two of his disciples were, were converts from the Sicarii, Judas Issachary, which quite, didn't quite make it, and Simon the Zealot. Zealot meant Sicarii. They were of a very highly religious, yet assassins. They murdered people. And there kept on being the Passover and the first fruits, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that is, after two days, and they kept on seeking the ones, high priest, chief priest, they kept on seeking that third person poor and perfect indicative active, a zone tone. They kept on seeking Jesus' life. These are malefactors. These are thieves and robbers and liars and perjurers and lawyers and judges. And yet they're all corrupt. Corrupt. Corrupt individuals. This is the most corrupt generation of Israelites that you could possibly put together. The chief priest, Akariates, Kai Hoi Grammates. The word Grammates that comes from grammar, our word grammar comes from it, but these are the scribes. These are the, these are the county clerks. They wrote down everything that happened. They knew who Jesus was. They knew exactly who he was. They knew he was born of the right family. He was born in the right place. He was raised in the right place. Everything about him, they knew all of this but they used it to try to tie him up. They used it to try to murder him. Of course they wanted to do it legally, but yet they broke all of their rules. Slothful servants. Israel was a scoundrel as a nation. The leaders of it were. There were individuals there that, that believed in God. Paul and Peter. Paul was a Saul, the one that, the Zealot, the Sicarii. He killed people for the, for, for the Jews. That's what he did. He was an assassin. Went down to Damascus to assassinate everybody he could find down there, except God stopped him on the way. They kept on seeking the the chief priests, the one chief priests and the one scribes, how him by bait <clears throat> by bait this is a fishing and a trapping term it's dolo in dole in dolo this means to put bait out to entrap somebody it means uh I like you go fishing. You put something real good to eat on that that hook. But under that hook, that thing's deadly. That thing will grab a hold of them and they can't get loose. But they'll eat it because they think it's good and it smells good and it tastes good and everything else and they get it in their mouth and all of a sudden they're hooked. Sometimes in the human race, people are hooked. And baited. 
up here in the mountains a long time ago, <clears throat> about 35 years ago, I was driving up this road right here that goes through my property. And I got up there and it was about this deep in snow, about three foot of snow, and it was all hard packed solid ice. And I was driving up, it's a real smooth road in the wintertime like that when, the ice, when, when it's got snow on it, it's just real smooth. Not bumpy, not washboard or anything. And I was going up there and I was a tribal hunter for the Western Shoshone tribe. Now, I'm Indian and they chose me to be their tribal hunter. And I had one of the other Indians with me and we were going up the road. And uh, I had a couple of deer rifles on, on a gun rack when, the, when you still did that. You know, now it's probably illegal in California, I'm sure. But we're in Nevada. I left guns on the gun rack all the time. They never went in the house. Anyway, we were up here deer hunting, and we were going up there, and I saw a forest ranger, a game warden. He's coming down out of these mountains up here in the wintertime. I was wondering what that guy doing up there. And we stopped on the side of the road. We had to pull off the road, and he went up there. And we opened my window, and I opened my window, and he opened his window, and I was driving a little Toyota uh, Tacoma, I think, a four-wheel drive at that time, 1988, actually. It was brand new, four-wheel drive. He comes up there and he said, what are you guys doing, trapping? I said, no, we're deer hunting. And he looked back like that, because this is not deer season. I said, we're deer hunting. He said, are you Indians? I said, yeah. I said, I'm the tribal hunter for the Western Shoshone, uh, Hank Patterson family. Oh, he said, good luck. But a lot of people will go up there in the wintertime when there aren't things for animals to eat as readily. Everything's hibernating. But the carnivores, they're looking for food. And there aren't many rabbits. There aren't many ground squirrels or anything else. Gophers for them to eat or anything. And they're out there and, and they put out these traps and they're a steel trap and they'll put bait there so they'll go and eat the bait and they'll get their foot caught in it and trapped. That's the word here, dole. This is the word trapped, dolo. To trap him by guile, deceit. You know, there are people out there that uh, I was pastor of a big church one time. And I was also a Sunday school teacher in the singles group. And the singles group, they called the meat market. And different people would come in there, different guys and different girls. And these people were predators. Predators. They would see who they could date. And I remember talking to girls, oh, he's so wonderful, he's such a wonderful man, he's so honest, and he's so... So, uh, moral, and I say, watch out. And before long, they were seduced and deceived, and then he would go on to the next one, or she would go on to the next one, to the next victim. Victims. This, these are predators here. They were religious predators. And during their high Passover feast and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where they're supposed to get all the sin out of the house, they're plotting murder. Now, I teach Hebrew, as you probably know. And what we say, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not commit murder. That's not what it says in Hebrew. It says, you shall not keep on lying, you shall not keep on murdering, you shall not keep on deceiving, you shall not keep on plotting, you shall not keep on stealing, and you shall not keep on murdering. These were murderers. These people didn't know God. Even though they had all the fineries, we see the, we see the publican, which was a tax collector, which were all looked down on by everybody. And we see the Pharisee standing. And they're praying in the marketplace out on the street. And the Pharisees, oh I thank God. 
I can tell you what he says. I thank God that I wasn't born a woman and that I wasn't born a Gentile. And I thank God that I am who I am and that you made me who I am and I am great. Well, that's who they are here, except they're not great. And there was a poor sinner over a publican over there and he beat on his chest and he said, Oh, oh, oh God, forgive me a sinner. He wouldn't look up to heaven. And that Pharisee was looking right square, looking light in the face of God, he thought, telling God how great he was. And this is who they are. Their hearts are full of sin and murder. They're, they're, they're murdering all the things that they say you shall not do. They were doing it. Moses, father-in-law of Jethro. I had several names. Jeter, Jethro, and Anyway, he uh, he told Moses, Moses, you've got too much work to do here. I want you to pick out 70 men. The 70 men that he told him to pick out had to be beyond reproach. Righteous men, not ones that take a bribe. You can't be, men that can't be bribed. And yet, here, the Sanhedrin, these are the people of the Sanhedrin, they are full of deceit. They are full of, of sin. They are full of murder. And yes, the Hebrew says, Thou shalt not keep on murdering. Thou shalt not keep on lying. Thou shalt not keep on deceiving. Thou not she help keep on coveting. And yet, this is what they are. The chief priests and the scribes and how him in guile by bait having latched on to and seized him, nominally plural masculine, first heirs, participle, active, having latched on to him and seized him, grabbed him, they might murder him. They might murder him. They might tear him to pieces. They might separate his body from his soul and his spirit. They wanted to do completely away with him. Matthew 24, 36 through 34 is a companion scripture with this. 14 and verse 2. Elagon garme ante eorte, me pote este thorubos tu wahu. And they kept on, for they kept on saying, not in the feast, not during the feast, not during the feast. Unless when he shall for himself be trouble. There shall be a trouble. There shall be a den, a thorubos. An outward expression of mental agitation, turmoil, commotion with the people. They were afraid of the people. Let's go kill him now. You know, we're supposed to be taking the lamb, remember? We're supposed to go down and confessing our sins on his head. I wonder how many of these people confessed the sins that they had murdered Jesus when they put their hands on that head and they slit that the head of that lamb, and they slit that ram's throat. Not one of these people went home with their sins forgiven. That, that Roman soldier was. He said, surely this is the Son of God. Yeah, Pontius Pilate believed. Five times he declared Jesus Christ innocent. And he says, shall I give you Barabbas, the murderer, or shall I give you Jesus? Barabbas, you know, the one that that went in and captured villages and, and held ran, held people for ransom and kidnapped, kidnapped the high priest? Shall I give you him or shall I give you Jesus? Now, there should have been an easy choice there to say, give us Jesus. And no murder kept on being in their hearts. Deceit kept on filling their life. Sin, they were full of sin and deception. Well, they kept on saying, not during the feast, because there's going to be a lot of trouble with the people. Let's read these last two verses in the Amplified now. 
And it was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the chief priests and the scribes were all quiet, seeking to arrest Jesus by secrecy and deceit and bait and put him to death. Well, they kept on saying, it must not be during the feast for fear that there might be a riot of the people and they can't carry on the religious going on. They can't carry on the religious services. Let's kill him before or after church. Let's kill him before or after church. Let's kill him right after we take the offering because we got to pay somebody to hand him over by deceit. Oh, we got to pay those false witnesses. Remember the Sanhedrin was supposed to be people that couldn't be bribed? And yet they're the ones that are bribing others to swear lies and to take a man at, in the night. They were supposed to have a trial and, and call in all witnesses and have a, a go over the flag saying this man is before he was even going to be executed. Is there a last witness? Is there one more witness? No, they didn't do that. Because their hearts were full of murder. Their souls and minds were full of deceit. And Pontius Pilate said, I find no fault in him. I find no guile in him. And he washed his hands. He said, I'm innocent of this man's blood. And they said, let this blood be upon us and our children. And it has been nearly 2,000 years. And they said at Masada, never another Masada. Oh, yes, there's going to be another Masada. It's going to be worse than Masada. Two out of every three Jews in the world is going to be killed. But God, in his mercy and his unconditional covenant with Abraham and David, he's going to use those rotten Jews one more time for a whole thousand years. And they're going to do what they should have done when Jesus came. They're going to worship him. And they're going to say, where did you get those wounds in your hands and your side? And he said, in the house of my friend. You people. Your ancestors did it. Jesus looked at those Jews and at them. He said, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, how many times I would have called you as a mother hen with her baby chicken, but you would not come. You who murdered the prophets, and you say that you're, they're your fathers. Oh yes, they murdered the prophets and they murdered the Messiah, King of Israel. Our only way of salvation, they murdered him. And yet it was according to God's will. Jesus came into this world to die. God sent his son into the world to die. We bring our children in the world. Do we don't want them to die. When we bring our little children in the world, we don't want them to die. We do everything we can do to keep them alive during their childhood sicknesses and everything else. We love them. Yet God brought his son into the world to die. That was the purpose to die. We die because we're sinners. We die because of disease. We die because of the infection of Adam's blood in our veins. But Jesus Christ didn't have it. God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. At the right time, at the right time, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to die for sinners. Jesus Christ died for you. You will not go to hell because of sin. You will go to hell because of rejection of Jesus Christ. No man goes to hell because of sin. They go to hell because of rejecting Jesus Christ as their Savior. If you're there tonight listening to this message tomorrow, a hundred years from now or five years from now, if you hear this message and you haven't come to the, to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, ask God to forgive you of your sins and begging him to grant you repentance and to save your soul. And I tell you what, he'll do it. Jesus Christ came to die for sinners. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. 
While they were yet sinners and plotters and murderers, he died for them. He died for these rats. They didn't go to hell because of sin. They went to hell. They didn't go to hell because of murder. They went to hell because they didn't accept him as their Messiah King and to ask him to forgive them of their sins. Pontius Pilate wrote a letter, and that letter, by the way, is quoted all over history from the very time, the contemporaries of that time. He wrote a letter to Tiberius Caesar, his father-in-law. In that letter, he says, the whole basilica, he said it was like the hounds of hell were tur turned loose on us. He said the very, their shouts of their voices were like the demons of hell had been opened up the bottomless pit. He said it was horrible. You would think the devil himself was there and all his cohorts. And he said, I couldn't turn him loose. I, I, I had to give them Jesus. He said, I had to give them this man. He said, if it's lawful to call him a man, for I know that he's one of the gods. He said he was the greatest sage of all time, more wisdom than any man, and not worthy to be in the presence of this, these things that would sell their own mother for physicians. He told him about that. He told him also, he said he walked in and had an interview with him, and he said it was like his feet were fastened to the floor and he could not loose his tongue. He said the man's presence was, it, it was under otherworldly. Well, Pontius Pilate knew who they were trying to murder. He told Jesus, Jesus, I'll never let them have you. I'll never let them have you. Jesus turned around. He said, Oh, Prince of the Earth, when my time comes, there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do. Pontius Pilate's wife, according to his letter, Pontius Pilate's letter to Tiberius and the Bible warned him not have anything to do with the trial of Jesus. Oh, there's nothing he could do about it. He tried every way he could to turn him loose. He used their own law against him. He said, you people are breaking your own laws. This, this isn't right. He said, this man is innocent. And yet you want him to die. And he took him and whipped him. He whipped him to within an inch of his life. And he said, in his mind, maybe, maybe they'll have mercy on him when they see he's almost dead. But yet they screamed like hounds from hell, he said. Begging, demanding his life. So he could do nothing about it. He humiliated him. He had the soldiers humiliate him. Everything he could do to try to pacify this mob of sinners with their hearts full of sin and murder. Father, I send this message out. I pray for each and every one that's listening to it that you dig in their life some way, whatever they need to, to deal with them. And help them to, in this end of the year message that they will make resolutions the next year to serve you closer, 